This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning a couple of noted market experts and well-recognized financial writers. Uh, no stranger to our regular listeners is Ty Andros, the president of TraderView, publisher of the TedBits website and writer and editor of his well-recognized newsletter, also named TedBits. Joining us today is Bert Dolman of the Wellington Letter from Los Angeles. Welcome. Yeah, nice to be with you. Bert, maybe we can begin with yourself, because though you were on in June, maybe some of our listeners didn't hear that show. If you could give my listeners a bit of of your background, the things that you're involved with. I've been uh, trading in the markets for over 35 years. Uh, I started my business in uh, January 1977 as an uh, economic and investment research business. Uh, We only do research. We don't uh, sell any investment uh, products like stocks or anything. Uh, we don't manage money, so we can be uh, totally unbiased. We can even use the word sell and sell short, which always works very nicely in bear markets, like in 2008. That uh, was a great year for us, and where most people uh, experienced a lot of pain. So uh, we have eight different uh, subscription services, some for short-term traders, some for longer-term investors. Uh, notice I said longer because we don't believe in long-term hold. So that's uh, that's what we do, and uh, we've been around for a long time. Uh, the average subscriber has been with us about 22 years. When we had you on last time, we uh, talked about China, and I was hoping today we'd follow up on some of those discussions and additionally expand it to Asia overall because clearly the shock waves that have started in, in China and Japan are now spreading right across Asia. Just to lead into the outstanding charts that you brought with you this morning, I have a couple to kind of set the stage. And this one I have up here now is showing the a five-year change of, of credit to GDP around the world. It certainly shows that in China, and we have talked about that last time, and we'll pick up on again today what's what's happening. But I'd also point out that as big a concern as the rate of change in credit is also, if you look on the left-hand side, is the contraction that's going on in the developed world. We've got two worlds out there, developing and developing, and they're both in different crises. And a contraction in credit is just as big a crisis potential as too much credit. And and I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see some of that here this morning. The second chart clearly shows the cascading effect that I mentioned. And these are the GDP forecasts across Asia. And you can see that they've been steadily coming down at it and at a significant rate. And the commonality is they all trade very heavily between each other and specifically with China. And I don't think this chart would come as any surprise to a lot of our listeners and well recognize that, that China itself has become a dominant player in many, many markets whether it's metals, whether it's even even in, in case of goods, consumer goods, so the consumption is, is notoriously low, uh, but a bit of a growing middle class. And any of these areas, if they're slowing, have ramifications around the world. And we have a protracted recession in Europe that, in my mind, has washed ashore in Asia that is now spilling over in all of the countries. Comment on that, Bert? Well, I think you just said it. The world is so interconnected now, and that is a big problem. Uh, Europe is in a deep recession. Uh, therefore, the European demand for Chinese goods has been reduced significantly. So we're seeing uh, export uh, growth in China not just diminishing, but actually exports are now declining. The last quarterly number, number was actually a decline of, uh, I think, 3.7% in exports versus expectations of about 3% growth. And so this was a real shocker, and it really shows you the, the problem that China has. Now, at the same time, they're getting hit uh, by the Japanese. The Japanese have uh, really devalued their currency, uh, cheapened it significantly, and that makes uh, Japanese goods so much uh, uh, cheaper in the world markets. So now you actually have high-quality Japanese goods 
competing price-wise with the inferior quality Chinese goods. Uh, so that's another pressure on Chinese exports. And that is, of course, also affecting the entire Asia uh, group. And that is a big, big problem right now. Uh, when finally the China problem surfaces, uh, it, then people will immediately get out of the Asian countries because they know that these Asian countries are very dependent on China growth. Yeah, I think everybody around the world is beginning to focus on the uh, possible hard landing in China. Certainly are cognizant of the developments with Abenomics in Japan, but I don't think everybody's fully grasping that Asia as a unit, which is 50% of the global GDP, now has the signals similar to what we saw in 2008 in the early stages. And I know, Bert, you follow very closely the credit markets and technical analysis, and I think that they've been showing you that for, for some time. You published an outstanding letter, the China Boom Bust Analyst, and your recent report, maybe we could start there, really lays out some of these issues in spades. Yeah, basically, you have a serious credit crunch in China right now. It's actually a credit crisis. If you're a, a small to mid-sized company, you cannot get any loans from anyone. Uh, the shadow banking system actually had been making up uh, for the declining uh, loan growth in the, from the banks. But the banks have actually, in order to circumvent the lending restrictions, restrictions imposed by the central government, they've been using these wealth management uh, entities that they formed together with brokerage firms in order to channel money to companies outside of the banking system. And they call that the shadow banking system. Now, the shadow banking system is now huge. It's uh, Some estimates are as high as $10 trillion of loans. No one knows where those loans are. No one knows uh, how to rescue any of these uh, entities when they finally uh, go belly up. Here you can see the chart of China's post-crisis credit boom. And uh, what's really significant here is the uh, the corporate is the uh, the grayish area the corporate loans uh, uh, from uh, from uh, the banks and then the, the buff part is the significant one the white the white part of the bar that is the shadow banking included and uh, this really shows you that over the last five years shadow banking has become an ever bigger part of uh, credit uh, for companies uh, now the, the interest rates in the shadow banking system are much, much higher. Uh, you, you can, you know, the average company probably pays 20, 25% interest, maybe 30%. But if you're really a small entity and you have to get a loan just to survive a few more months, you can pay up over 100% interest. So it's a, you know, it's a basically a, sh a shadow, uh, I mean, it's a mafia lending practice. Yeah, hey, this is shark loans. I mean, this is yeah. not banking. Well, this loan is loan sharking. Yeah. The problem is, is that, uh, when, you know, China is a land of savers. But they're also greed bags, and just like anybody. And they and those savers who brought the money to the shadow banking system for wealth management products and to fund these loans, um, they're not going to get the money back. And the money's gone or been exported or stolen or what have you. And so there's going to be a great social upheaval when those savings uh, really, uh, you know, they think of them as a deposit. But um, I promise you they're speculation. Yeah, that's so true, uh, Ty, what you just said. Uh, you know, I, I would bet that the majority of this $10 trillion of loans in the shadow banking system, the majority will default. And that means a total impoverishment of the average person in, in China. So the, if the government is really betting on the, the consumer sector taking over, uh, uh, you know, for the weakness in the export sector, uh, the consumers aren't going to have the money. Their money is, is being pulverized right now in the shadow banking system because it is the people's money that goes into these wealth management products in order to get a higher rate of interest than the 3% that they allow in the banks. And so here these people are reaching for a higher return on their savings, and instead they're going to lose all of their money. This is a terrible, and those problems are going to surface next year, if not before. You sent me this month's letter that the June crisis, where China claimed that it was it was done intentionally to try and slow this credit growth, bring the shadow banking under control. You say that's not the case at all. And in fact, you believe the government simply lost control. Yeah, that's my uh, suspicion, because suddenly overnight interest rates shot up from about 7% to 25%. Uh, 
And uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the government can figure out that this is just horrendous for the shadow banking system. This is more than just trying to get shadow banking under control. This is actually unleashing a crisis because suddenly the banks are telling you that they are not making any more loans. Even the ATM, if you want to get your money out of an ATM machine or go to the teller, the banks for a number of days wouldn't give you any money and they blamed it on system failures. You know, they were having computer problems. Unfortunately, it was all the major banks had the same system uh, problems. Uh, so if you can't uh, withdraw your money from the bank, your own money from the bank, uh, you know that there's a serious problem. I would really doubt that the government had intended that. Well, that, and uh, I'm going to just say that I believe it really points up a, a lot of duration mismatches there as well, where they've got to provide liquidity when runs happen and when the, I'll call it the overnight loan window, closed up, they were unable to meet those runs. And I think that scared the, the you know, the, the scared the daylights out of the government. And I guess, um, you know, with the shy bore, it could have been a slip of the hand or it began as a little exercise in, in a uh, shot across the bow, but uh, they quickly found out uh, how out of control it actually was. Is this what's prompting, Bert, the Chinese government stepping in and doing a national audit to get some of these statistics under control? Or is that just a, a bit of a cover-up? Or maybe they just don't know how bad the problem is? Gordon, I, I think it's the latter. They really don't know how big the problem is, and they're getting ready for something serious. And yeah. they want to know where where the problems are and how they can possibly manage a problem when it uh, surfaces for everyone to see. Remember, in 2007 in the United States, it was Ben Bernanke, head of the Federal Reserve, who said at that time that the subprime loan problem, which were starting to surface because of all the defaults, that couldn't possibly infect the rest of the credit markets. He said at the time it was only 2.7% of the entire mortgage market was subprime. Well, that's another one of these statistics that professors use. He is a professor after all, and uh, uh, that may be true for all the subprime loans in the market, but if you took the mortgage loans made for the three prior years at that time, it was probably a good 70% of the mortgage loans were subprime. So uh, that was totally false, and we, of course, saw that the subprime loan problem it did really infect all of the credit markets at that time. We're seeing something very similar in China right now. We have the China bulls. They say, oh, the government is going to be handled that. After all, they make the rules, and, you know, it's a, it's a central control, etc. There is no way that uh, you can deny reality. Reality continues, even if you deny it. And uh, sooner or later, you have to face reality. And uh, if they don't know where these $10 trillion are in the sh shadow banking system, how are they ever going to uh, resolve that situation? The only thing that the government can do in China, they can rescue the big SOEs, the, the state-owned enterprises. These are owned by the government. They're run by the princelings, which are all descendants of the uh, Mao Zedong's gang. And uh, so they will be able to get the loans. They will be bailed out. Uh, but that's not all of China. That's a, that's a small part of uh, the, the companies in China. And the rest, are, they're not going to be able to help them uh, because the, the central government can pump money into the banks, which are all, you know, the, the banks are in such ter terrible shape. It's estimated that about 40 to 50 percent of all the bank loans are bad loans right now. OK, so uh, the government can put money into the banks, but the banks aren't going to lend that out. The, it's going to be just like in the U.S. The banks will say, why do we want to make more loans and have a, even a bigger problem in our loan portfolio? Bert, you argue many times that, that credit is about confidence and sentiment. Credit is not about the money supply, which comes first here. And really what we're seeing here in this chart I have up now shows that there's a fast and quickly eroding confidence in the Chinese growth story, which in itself is going to spill over into this credit problem. Is that is that a real possibility? Exactly. That's exactly it. The confidence is gone. If you talk to I was in China in December, and uh, the first 15 minutes of, of talking to anyone, like hedge fund managers and so on, it's the Chamber of Commerce speech. You know, everything is wonderful. And then after they, they know that you know much more about what's really going on, then they open up and they tell you how serious things are. 
Uh, and right now there's absolutely no confidence over there. And credit growth, you know, we focus in, in my firm on uh, two, uh, two methods of analysis. One is the credit markets that give us the, the big trend, whether it's up or down. When the credit, credit and liquidity expands, the investment markets have to go up. When uh, credit and liquidity contracts, the investment markets have to decline. It's just that simple. And uh, you, you don't have to look at 50 to 100 different economic indicators. Uh, all you have to do is look at the credit markets, and that's what we do. And to get the final timing on the markets, we use technical analysis, which is price volume in the investment markets, measuring if money is flowing into the markets or flow, flowing out of the markets. And that measurement is going to be very, very important over the next several weeks because it's our estimate that money is going, is going to be flowing out of the markets as the big guys on Wall Street know that they have to get out of course, if the bull market is going to be promoted to attract the naive money managers. After all, you know, if Wall Street wants to sell, they got to have a buyer on the other side, right? When you were with us in June, you, you felt that the overall markets, and specifically U.S. market, would hold up fairly well and rise through the summer months. But as we got into late August, uh, that would be a different story. I gather you still believe that. So far, as they say in Washington, it's still operative. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, yes. And, you know, we uh, we analyze the situation almost every day and uh, to see if something has changed. Uh, and in 2007 and 2008, I was just hoping that something was changing because I said 2008 is going to be the, like 1929. It's going to be a global meltdown in the markets. And I even wrote a book in 2007 called Prelude to Meltdown. And uh, I, But I kept on hoping that something would change so it wouldn't happen. But nothing changed. And uh, Washington was totally oblivious to the problem. And on Wall Street, not too many people uh, recognized what was going on. And it's the same thing now in China. China is, is, is the big elephant. And uh, what happens in China is now going to infect the entire world. Look at it. In the late 1990s, we had a global crisis, was short term, but it was triggered by Thailand, that little country of Thailand, a precipitated a crisis. Can you imagine a, a, a serious crisis that surfaces in China now, what that is going to do to the world? We're seeing the effects already. China's exports are down. So that means that the Chinese consumer is getting poorer. Uh, and that means that China is able to export less to other countries. So it's a, it's a circle. Uh, nobody's buying more from anyone else, and everything is shrinking. And uh, eventually, right now, the U.S. is still the, the best country. Somebody uh, at the conference in a, a few weeks ago said uh, the U.S. is the best horse in the glue factory. And we need to stress glue factory here. Exactly. Uh, so that doesn't mean it's great. Uh, you know, it's probably going to be the last one to be made into glue. I just put out a, a, a series that, uh, with about 30 charts that indicate to me that we're on the verge or, or in a recession in the United States. And we're very close to it. And we're definitely at the stall speed. And I think we're going over the, the top. So if we're the shining light right now, we, uh, we got some, this could be a shock. That, that triggers or accelerates this problem in in Asia. You mentioned, you know, talking about credit, but you said you also look at the technical charts to tell you. You brought some technical charts up. Can you yeah. help help our listeners with those? Sure, Gordon. As you know, you know the first markets uh, to go are usually the the most vulnerable ones, and commodities are very vulnerable uh, to a, a reduction in global demand. And the commodity markets all look very bearish. And of course, one uh, commodity that everyone knows about is gold, right? Gold and silver. So, uh, the other uh, area that's very sensitive is emerging markets. Uh, when the big money flows get worried, they go out of the smaller countries for, and they go into the larger markets like the U.S. for safety. We're seeing this now. The emerging markets look absolutely awful. Uh, in, in fact, uh, if you take a look at the, the charts right now of Thailand, of Korea, of Taiwan, they look ghastly. These are great short selling opportunities. And, and I always try to emphasize that. Yes, it's going to be a bad time here for, uh, you know, the next several months. 
but it's going to be a great profit opportunity. In 2008, in September and October, during that time, we recommended five different uh, inverse ETFs that rise when the markets go down. They gain an average of 72% in, uh, in six weeks' time. So you can make a lot of money during a time like this. Look at this uh, chart of the Taiwan index and look at this uh, the dot below today. It had a huge look, look down at those, gap. Look at those yeah. breakaway gaps. It's yeah. just incredible. That yeah. That is real damage there. Yeah. This is, I, the, this, this is the warning. Yeah. Island reversals, breakaway down gaps. Uh, that means, it means that it's urgent selling. That's what it is. This is like the uh, Thailand chart with the bot back in 97, beginning of the Asian crisis. So. And completely unreported by anybody. Yeah, they don't like to talk about that on financial TV. What is the influence of Abenomics having across the region because of the dramatic shift in currencies? And, uh, you know, you and I had talked previously of how it's washing on the shores of places like Korea that are just getting killed with their abilities to, to export. What are you seeing there, Bert? See, this is uh, so important, uh, this question of Japan. Before, you know, we were looking at, at China. Uh, in fact, uh, one year ago, we put out a 150-page ebook uh, called The Coming China Crisis. Okay? And I had all the things in there. I said, when this thing uh, happens, it's going to be very, very bad for the global markets. Well, since that time, now something else has developed, which will make it even worse. And that's, that's Abenomics in Japan. They have, uh, basically intentionally, they have cheapened the, uh, the, the currency value. The currency has just plunged and in an effort to make their products more attractive to the world markets. So the stock market has soared as a result. In my opinion, that's over now because everyone and their dog is in that trade and it's the yen carry trade. They are short the yen because the government wants the yen to, to get weaker. And they are long the Japanese market. Everyone is in this. All the big trading operations. The big trading operations operate with huge leverage. When they buy stocks, it's probably with a leverage of 10 to 1. Okay. When they, when they uh, short the yen, it could be a leverage of 100 to 1. This is huge. And so when this market starts reversing, everyone has to get out of their positions because when you're short the yen at a, a leverage of 100 to 1, that means if the yen has a 1% rise in value, it wipes out all of your equity in the trade. Okay, so this is uh, horrendous. And in my opinion, what's going to happen here very soon is that the yen carry trade will start unwinding and everybody's going to be running to the exits in that trade. And when they run for the exits, that means that they get margin calls. And when they get margin calls, they have to sell anything that's saleable in their portfolios. So it's the most liquid stuff. They can't even think, is this a good stock that we should hold? No, you've got to sell it because you need the cash to meet the margin call. And this is the kind of thing that triggers a crisis. You know, I don't uh, want to paint the devil on the wall, but well, there's, something, there's potential for something very serious. I'd like to add a few curveballs in there. And the curveballs are, first of all, one, they are running the hugest experiment I've ever seen on, on Mises because he has said you can never let people know that the policy of government is inflation. And they are shouting it from the rooftops over there. And then at the same time, you have, I'm going to call it a true war going on uh, to see who gets deck chairs on the Titanic of who gets the business, and whether it be Korea or Singapore or Taiwan or Japan, um, the implications for the yen um, going lower and being cut in half are momentous. However, I guess I'm going to say I'll make a I'm going to make a I'm going to make a um, a prediction here, and I'm going to say that I don't believe the yen is going to fall like everybody says it is because of the huge amount of debt, and that debt is an actually a great big artificial short position. Yeah, the, the, Ty, that's what I just said. You know, the, the yen, in my opinion, has stopped falling. Uh, I, uh, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I c couldn't agree more. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, I'll call it the, 
the I'll call it the nitroglycerin over there is what Japan's trying to do. Some of our listeners may not be f- familiar that you know the Japanese carry trade has been a cornerstone of funding for almost 20 years now. As Japan took the interest rates and for and was the forerunner of ZERP and quantitative easing, and I can actually show you charts that when it slowed the carry trade and funded a huge amounts of the euro's initiation and growth and the money into the peripheral uh, countries. So the yen starts to increase in value. That comes to a screeching halt. It, it's a global issue. It's not just a Nikkei issue that uh, that we started this conversation with. Clearly, it's over, overstated, but it's right around the world. And I think that the carry trade right now is money that's being you pushed into the developing world's uh, markets, the, even the equity markets. That, and when it reverses, Bert, you're so right. It's like a panic and rush to the doors, and you've got no choice to sell. And we saw the precursor in June uh, with the panic. And what happened there with the bond market spiking, at least the interest rates, is the bond prices dropped down, and so the volatility increased. And people should understand that the bond market is the 800-pound gorilla compared to the equity markets. And when you get that kind of volatility, what you get is you get an increase in val- what they call VAR, value at risk, which from a tier one, tier two capital for the banks and financials means they have to increase their collateral. And suddenly it is a huge issue. And when you have the shortage of high quality collateral we have today, there's panic. And what's happening in my mind right now, Bert, everybody's scared of that happening. And they can't find the collateral, and it's and they're starting to shift, and that's why they're repatriating. They're getting out of emerging markets. They're trying to find any home, and these are the early signs that I think surfaced in June. And you pointed that out back in our last show. Yeah, you see that this is exactly it. And you know, people uh, can't say well, but nobody else no is saying that. Nobody on TV is saying that. Here are all these analysts and so on. But it's a fact that crashes are really not predicted by a lot of people. You know, and that's why there are crashes. Well, my experience has been it's not in their vested interest to go out and tell people that because they're paid to invest. So where are they going to do? Put it in the bond market, put it in the stock market, and uh, they're going to. It's a losing proposition. They can't. They're not paid to have money sitting on the side. And there's very few people like yourself that can be on the short side and invest, which is a dangerous game to be on the short side. Guys, thank you very much for the time. Great discussion. There's so much to talk about. Bert, we'll have you back again and just keep following this unwinding. It seems like every time we have you on, there's a key event. The last time was the complete explosion in the Shibor in June, and today we've got Taiwan literally collapsing here. So I don't know what it'll be next time, but your timing is impeccable. <laughs> I think it's your timing because you invited me. Okay. okay see you guys <laughs> later. Okay. All right. Goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Gordon. Good to see you. Talk to you. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.